uh, my talk and thank you that I have the possibility to talk here and give the last talk because it was really a very nice and interesting conference. And I tried to do some links with a different metrics model, as Severin already told, it's quite similar to the Concevich model, but it does not fit in the class of generalized Concevich model as they are looking at. And the work I will present here is spread over several preprints we had. And at the beginning, we uh, even at the beginning here in this paper, we even didn't know that there's some link to topological recursion. Okay. So first I want to explain something, how we can get from a non-commutative quantum field theory to a matrix model with an external matrix. And uh, then I define the matrix model, what we are interested in. I show loop equations and they satisfy at the end blob topological recursion, where we have a proof for G equals zero. And if I have enough time, I maybe will also say something about non-crossing partitions which also occur in our model. So let's start. So I define a quantum field theory, a scalar quantum field theory on the Moyal space. So the Moyal space was mentioned by Walter von Sulikom in his second talk. Uh, he said there you can define or you can have your spectral triple where the algebra are the Schwarz functions and uh, the Hilbert space are the L2 space. And you can also then define the Dirac operator. And this will have an interpretation of a space which is deformed and this is called the Moyal space. And we are looking at the quantum field theory on this deformed Moyal space um, scalar, which means the phi maps to R um, in dimension D. Okay, and the action function is defined here. So we take an integral as in quantum field theory. You have phi, then you have your Laplacian, you have here an important additional term, your mass, and the star from the Moyal space, and here phi star, phi star, phi star, phi, four times. So this is the Laplacian and the mass and lambda here in front is the coupling constant. And okay, I have to say a little bit about this middle term here. It's of the form of the uh, harmonic oscillator. And this is necessary to make this quantum field theory renormalizable. Don't ask about the details. We don't care later about it. I will put this omega to one and inside this expression here is a matrix theta. So theta is defined here as the identity D over two of the dimension and then times this matrix. And here we have one parameter and this is the important parameter, this is V. And V describes how non-commutative your space is. So if V is zero, actually here it's not commutative. So you have a pointless product. But the star product occurring here all the time is defined in the following way that you have two integrals over dk dy and then g so these two schwarz functions are then integrated over so this is not so important it's only like uh, i want to show the formula but in case let's say v is equal zero which means that this matrix is zero then this part is zero you can integrate over dk which gives you here e to the ik gives a Dirac delta distribution, you can integrate over dy and gets only g of x times h of x. And this is then the point was product. So in the end, we are interested not in the limit where v goes to zero. So we don't want to get again the commutative limit, but we are, sorry. So, but we are interested in the limit where v goes to infinity. Okay, and what is the interesting thing of this Moyal algebra. So this algebra has the star product and the star product has a matrix basis. So if you know the basis, which is explicitly known, then it has uh, the matrix product. Uh, so F and M, F, K, L is given by Delta M, K, F and L, and this has a trace. So, and the point is that if you have a function, which is, uh, let's say, if you want smooth, but it's not necessary that it's smooth or so any continuous function vanishing at infinity, you can expand it inside this basis FNN, which is a matrix basis. And if you have a scalar real quantum field theory or this function, as I mentioned, this uh, coefficients are Hermitian. So you get a Hermitian matrix. So now we can use these two properties here 
and this expansion for phi and insert it in this function, in this action, this function action, action function. Let's say. <laughs> and what we get is a matrix model. So we have here only traces. So we sum over phi and m, and here we have an en in front, and then we have here some quadratic term and our quartic term, which is actually a trace at the end. And here we have in front of this quadratic term some en, which you can write as a matrix. So we have e times phi times phi. And uh, we have a quite explicit expression for this ens. And I have included here the Z and Z and Lambda bear. These are from physics. So some uh, renormalization constants. I will not care about them in the, in, the, uh, in the rest of the talk. And the important case is that this ENs can carry some multiplicities. And this will then later define the dimension of our space we started with. But I don't will go into this, uh, into this limits. So I will talk now only about this matrix model without somehow um, going too much into this quantum field theory direction. <clears throat> so I define the quartic conservage model. So the quartic analog of the conservage model as, um, yeah, we're integrating over Hermitian matrices. We have an external matrix E with positive eigenvalues. And then the partition function is given by integrating over all Hermitian matrices. And we have E, this external matrix times phi squared plus lambda over four times phi to the four. So this is, and this does not fit in the class of generalized conservative model. I, I will show you maybe, uh, short can say why. So if you want to interpret this now as a quantum field theory, this would have a dimension zero case. We have no renormalization constants here which means z is equal one, lambda form a parameter, and the e is positive. And I will assume this as a formal matrix model. So as all the time here in the conference. So, and uh, some facts. So this quartic conservative model is not in the class of this generalized conservative model where you have typically this shape, where you have this lambda, or it was v prime of lambda in the talk before, uh, times the linear part times, or plus a potential, and if you want to bring this in front of the quadratic part, what happens then is actually that you have all this decoration of your, um, of your vertices, which uh, Severin explained in the previous talk. So this is really not possible. And we are uh, looking at this model from a different point of view than looking at this model here. <clears throat> okay, so this is the model we are interested in. So maybe, have a last look at it, don't forget it. And then what we want to compute are a certain type of co correlation functions. And this is the definition of this correlation function we are interested in. So we are looking at the expectation value of the cumulant of the expectation value of the phi. Okay, it's a little bit uh, not so nice. I mean, it's quite complicated to, to define it or to understand it by the first time, but we have here phi pi one one pi p, p11 p21 and then p21 p31 up to pn11 p11 so we have here a closed cycle and then we have so this upper one does not mean that you take the power of it or here this is only some 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 additional index and we have at the end b of these cycles so we have disjoint cycles as in fully simple maps. <clears throat> and we have B of them, and each of them has the length, so the ith has the length ni. This is only the definition. And okay, we take this abbreviation. And then you can also have a genus expansion in them. So we are looking at some expectation values, which have the cyclic order, which can be interpreted in terms of fully simple maps. So if we put our external metrics to the identity only, we will get actually for this expectation values, fully simple quadrangulations of certain lengths of the boundary. But okay. So, and okay, for the definition, assume this, all these EPIJs are not equal. They are pairwise distinct. Um, we have B boundaries because B cycles and each of them has the length in i. 
So yeah, this was the remark. So we are looking at the kind of disjoint cycles. This is related to a fully simple maps quadrangulation if we set the external matrix to the identity. But uh, that's not the rest of the story. We have to define generalized correlation functions. <clears throat> so it turns out in the later loop equation that we need derivatives with respect to E, Q, N of these correlation functions. I mean, this is if you compute the loop equations or the Dyson Schwinger equations by the usual techniques. And this means, first of all, that we have two different classes of kind of boundaries. We have on the one hand here, this cyclic boundaries. And on the other hand, boundaries, which are defined by these derivatives. So we have here, M different boundaries, we call them, and B different cyclic boundaries. So we can say that we have something of genus G with M plus B boundaries, which are of different type, first of all. And um, you should have in mind all the time, this is very similar to the two matrix model. And the two matrix model do have also two different classes of boundaries. You have on one hand, this non-mixed boundaries, which you, should think of these derivatives here. This will give you kind of non-mixed boundaries. And the cyclic order here, or the cyclic boundaries will give you the mixed boundaries. Also the mixed boundaries have this cyclic um, symmetry. So, and this is what you should have in mind. <clears throat> Good, so very complicated definition at the beginning, similar to a mission two matrix model, if you want to define a very general um, expectation value. And then what you can do is you can compute for a completely generic TG, um, the loop equation. I mean, this is not so easy, but uh, it should be clear how it will work. There's a usual techniques. And I wrote here only um, some example. This is for a generic TG. And we see here, okay, we want to compute this one. We have something on the left. And then here's some additional term. Okay, it's not important, but we have on the right-hand side only things which are somehow of less topology in the sense of the Euler characteristic. So we have here one, two, three, four, five, six terms. And if you look at the very generic loop equation of the emission two matrix model, it has exactly the same six terms on the right-hand side. So the structure of this loop equations is completely similar to the Hermitian two matrix model. If you identify this cyclic boundaries with the mixed boundaries and this other with the non-mixed boundaries. And okay, I don't want to go into the details, but um, you see that here again, this derivative appear. This is why we needed it. So it appears all the time here. And this is why we had to define it like that. Okay, then what, what are the starting expectation values what we need to build all this tower of results or all this tower of um, expectation value? What is the, the first one we need? And then I define this omega G Q1 up to QM, which you can maybe think of only deriving the free energy with respect to these eigenvalues. So it means maybe in the picture of the two matrix model that you have only non-mixed boundaries. This is also there, the starting point. But it turns out actually this this omega Q1 up to QM um, satisfy a little bit different loop equation, loop equations as in the two matrix model. I mean, for a generic correlation function, they're completely the same, but for these omegas, it's slightly different. So the starting point is slightly different than in the Hermitian two matrix model. And okay, maybe I will say that this omegas, we will later multiply them by all the dx's and so on. So they will give uh, this small omega gn's. So you should think of they will satisfy more or less than topological or the blob topological. Have that in mind. So, and then the first theorem we found is the solution of this omega. So this omega genus zero with one boundary is given by y of z minus some potential. I will define it here. If you send z to epsilon q. So, and what is then x of z 
and y of z they are given by some function r of r of z and y of z is minus r of minus z and this uh, potential we define by x plus okay here the sum of all the different eigenvalues of this external matrix and here this uh, denominator but the important thing is how is this function r of z defined which gives you then x of z and y of z so this function r of z is defined by this expression where all the time this epsilon k's appear this epsilon k's are defined if you put an epsilon k in the r of z you get an e again so the external um, eigenvalue of the matrix which is given so you need somehow to to evaluate this epsilon to go from the x plane and the picture of topological recursion to the y plane but it's quite ugly defined right you have here this implicit definition r of z defined by r prime of of epsilon and the epsilons are defined by the e's but this is if you if you know the concevich model you will find similarities because in the concevich model i mean if you look at the paper of Aina, he had the eigenvalues small lambda and this lambda heads this lambda heads are some deformations of the lambdas and you think in our case this epsilon as deformation of the east so these are some of the eigenvalues of the external matrix and these are the, the deformation it has very similar structure and uh, we have proven if you define these functions and have this uh, relation here put evaluated at z equal epsilon k this gives you exactly some of the first result which gives a hint of maybe a spectral curve we can have so the spectral curve in this in this picture here is of genus zero because it has a rational parametrization uh, and it's given again x of z equal to r of z and y of z equal to minus r of minus z and it's important to mention here maybe that we have a global symmetry on the spectral curve this is a quite interesting thing and um, i was asking a few times okay this does not really appear somewhere else that you have or maybe in your paper also you have similar things but um i mean in other papers it's not appearing so much and okay good then i mean we have now an interpretation of x of z and then we can do this analytic continuation the complex continuation by um, x of z by saying we define omega gn with n variables such that at evaluated at the epsilons it should give us the omega q1 up to qn and in the same way we also define also tg where we have here n some non-mixed boundaries and b mixed boundaries also it's saying evaluated at the epsilons it will give us the expectation value um, the problem here is maybe that this uh, complex continuation is of course not unique you can define it as you want but you want to define it in such a way i mean we defined it on the loop equations in a very natural way and it turns out this is actually the right definition because the results are symmetric under um, under the variables and maybe one example if you compute some of this correlation function which is the you can think of in the hermitian two matrix model if you have one boundary one mixed boundary with two different colors on it and it's of this form here and it has a product representation um, in a way that here you have x of z plus y of z no, plus y of w and this um, z hat k's are the pre-images with respect to x so you have a product over all pre-images and this is exactly of the same form in the Hermitian two matrix model if you look at um, yeah, the correlation function with one boundary with two colors with one mixed boundary so there are direct similarities here at the first topology but then what happened if you want to compute omega zero two by this first of all not so nice loop equations turns out it has a different form so this term here in red is some some kind of different um, shape and also some terms here and here but i don't want to talk too much about it but here this part here will give you a pole on the anti-diagonal so omega zero two is given by the usual bergman kernel one over z minus 
W squared plus something on the anti-diagonal. This is quite interesting that it happens and it's, it's not our choice. I mean, we compute only the solution of this equation by looking at the poles and then by Liouville theorem saying that um, if you have no poles, let's say on the Riemann sphere, it should be a constant and this is um, asymptotically zero and then it's everywhere zero. So, um, so it's not so hard in that case to compute omega zero two. But then we are continuing computing the next one. I mean, this is really by hand a computation. It's uh, very, very hard to do. But what we then find is that we have again a slightly different loop equation. I don't want to show it. And then we define the ramification points of X by beta I. And uh, the solution is the following that we have, uh, okay, we took all the derivatives with respect to X out of the expression. And here in blue, you see the pole at the ramification point in Z. And we have two additional terms, which has a pole on the anti-diagonal Z plus U or Z plus V. And this expression, first of all, for, or maybe first of all, this blue expression is not symmetric if you, under V, U, and Z. But together with these two other terms, it is symmetric actually. You can check it by looking at all the poles or whatever. This is very interesting and gives you, first of all, an expression which seems not to be symmetric, but actually it is. And here um, in this expression in blue, you see, or you expect maybe that you have a pole at V equal minus the ramification point and also at U minus the ramification point. But this is actually not true because here you have also poles in this expression because of the symmetry of the spectral curve between X and Y. And here also a pole at minus beta and this somehow uh, vanishes then. Okay, let's go further. Then the main theory, which I actually want to talk today about is this one. And I actually want to go a little bit through the proof to get an expression, uh, how we get this formula. So we define small omega GN by, okay, some, uh, some scaling here and uh, times dx z1 up to dx zn. And we subtract here the uh, potential again as usual. And then the result is that for genus zero and I is a set of uh, uh, u, u1 up to un. So as usual, you are using in topological recursion this notation. And we have one part here in blue which is given by the formula of topological recursion. And one part in red, which is a very similar type, but it evaluates residues at Q on the anti or, or minus UK, which gives you poles on the anti diagonal at the end. So again, beta I are the ramification points, sigma is the local Galois involution, and this kernel is uh, of the form S in topological recursion. But I have to mention, I, so if you compute this, usually you take the full omega zero two to compute this kernel, but we are taking only the Bergman part to compute this kernel. And also here, it's of a very similar shape. So you have here, let's say if you send, uh, what is it, Q to minus U, you have here something which vanishes. And to the order one here, something which also vanishes of order one. And this part here will give no pole then. So this is regular, this, this kernel, if you send Q to minus U. Okay, and uh, maybe some comments on the structure of this omega zero ends we have. So the first one is given as in topological recursion, uh, Y dx. And then omega zero one is given by an additional part, one over Z plus U squared. And for any N, they are at the end symmetric. So we will produce something which is a symmetric structure, which is not obvious if you look at the results. And it has poles at the ramification points and, and the anti-diagonals. And uh, this omega zero Ns, we can integrate them so there are differential forms, which are, I think of exact. So you can integrate each variable with respect to dx. 
and we have two different kernels, Ki and K tilde, uh, which are only built by the usual Bergman kernel. So you somehow integrate over only the Bergman kernel to get this. This is unusual in topological recursion, I would say. But otherwise, let's assume you would also include this red part in uh, the kernel. What happens then, you would automatically produce poles on minus the ramification points. But this is actually at the end, not there, because all the omega g, all the omega zero ends have only poles at the ramification points, at the anti-diagonal, but not on minus the ramification points. <clears throat> okay, let's go a little bit or we'll talk about the proof. First of all, we have two proofs. Uh, one proof um, needs this reflection identity we found, and this first proof is very ugly and hard computation. It's very similar to the computations by Anna and Orontor in the first papers about the two matrix model, where they try to prove or to do computation and two matrix model really, let's say brute force. They computed the results and inserting it again and they find some structure, but in their papers, they couldn't prove first, not topological recursion, but later there's a proof with Chekhov together. And this is um, yeah, achieved by a new formula for the spectral curve they got, it, uh, they said. So this is really uh, a new technique they used here in this paper. This is from 2006 or 2007. So the first uh, proof here, this is written in our uh, recent paper from Reimer and me. But the second proof I will talk today about, uh, I found uh, roughly one month ago, and this is really in the language of topological recursion, I would say. And it's very similar to the formula uh, in this paper of uh, Chekhov, Enna, and Odonto. And actually, I was motivated, or my motivation for this proof was a paper of Elba, Savarin, uh, Enna, and Rosa Rafael Billiard, um, how this formulation should be right. But we need an extension to get blob topological recursion. So I will concentrate on the second version of the proof. So how do we do that? We define this function h, 0, n plus 1, and p, 0, n plus 1, by this expression. Don't ask me why I need this expression. This is the right one. I mean, this is what I had to found. What is the right function of interest? What is the right object? And actually, this h, 0, n, is a rational function in x, but not in z and not in the other, other variables. And also, p is a rational function in x of v and x of z. So this is important. And then you have to prove that these two functions satisfy this type of loop equation. So the loop equation of H is given by this omega times H over all the possible two partitions. And this is then equal to this other rational function, X of V and X of Z. And also this function, this T, where you have, um, what was it? N non-mixed boundaries and one mixed boundary of only length two. Uh, satisfies also the same equation, but on the right-hand side, we have here the H. So this is some coupled equation. And the important thing is this H zero N, if you expand it for high X of V, gives at first order the omegas again. This is also how it's used in the other paper. You need some, um, some auxiliary function, which gives at first order your omega. And then you take the definition of the paper, which is actually motivated by the paper of uh, Chekhov, Enna, and Oranto, of this function um, calligraphical E for, I only give here the definition for genus zero, where it's a sum of all possible partitions of uh, N part I partitions, where I is here, of a certain T. So this T underline is uh, T1 up to TI. And then you have here, at the first variable, okay, without the semicolon here, I guess, TK and a product over all of them. And then what the main thing is, you have to define this H tilde and P tilde in the following way that you have, okay, this is for genus zero only. This is why this upper definition with the calligraphical E holds. 
in the following way that you have here this part where you sum over two sets, so two partitions, J1, J2, and you include here the J1. And I have one additional term which, is, which comes now from blob topological recursion. So this term vanishes if J1 is the empty set. So if J1 is the empty set, this is the ordinary way how you um, do it in these other papers. But if J1 is not, uh, J1 is the full set, sorry. J, if J2 is the empty set, then this vanishes. If, but if J2 is not the empty set, you have this additional term here. Okay, this additional term I have to explain a little bit. I used here shorthand notation with this D J2 Q underline. So Q underline is a subset of J2 of uh, I elements. <clears throat> and then you have also here this operator, which is more or less, you think only this is an abbreviation for very complicated expressions. But actually what this operator does, it acts on the Y producing omega zero two, and then on the omega zero two producing omega zero three and so on. So this is only a shorthand notation. So this is, I don't assume that any of these operators exist or so on. This is only shorthand notation, but it seems the right. And then what you have to prove is that, um, okay, wait. One thing which is important here, this T underline, you take a subset of all uh, the pre-images of Z, and um, this is important because you start with the first pre-images, pre-image, and you take up to the D pre-image. And um, if you define your P tilde, you also include Z, which means that P is at the end rational function in X of Z, but H not. And what you then do is you have to show that, first of all, these two definitions will give you the same recursive equation here and also give you a recursive equation here. So this recursive equation of the same form. And then you see that you can multiply by the denominator and this is at the end the polynomial and you get enough points on the polynomial that this polynomial, polynomial is uniquely defined. And which means at the end that you prove really this H and H tilde is equal in P and P tilde. So this is, uh, this is quite, I mean, by direct computation, it's very, very hard to get this representation of H, but with the right definition, it's rather easy, let's say, but quite technical at the end anyway, but to prove that. And what, uh, what you get then, the third step of the proof is you expand H around um, X of V going to infinity. So the first leading order term will give you the linear loop equation. We talked about the linear loop equation. I don't want to uh, say much more about it. I guess everybody should know it. The linear loop equation and topological recursion, but the linear loop equation does not vanish on the right-hand side. Usually in topological recursion, if you look at the linear loop equation, um, this is in the first paper of Ana and Autonto, where they, in the, yeah, in the famous paper, that for n greater than two, or greater than one, um, this should vanish on the right hand side. But in our case, it does not vanish. It has something with a pole on the antidiagonal. And the quadratic loop equation here has on the right hand side. Usually this also vanishes on the right-hand side. There's also poles on the antidiagonal. Here's a pole on the diagonal, which is somehow uh, vanished by omega zero two. And these poles here are vanished by omega zero one. So we don't care about these two terms at the end, but this red term is some of very interesting structure. And it's actually more or less of the same form as this one here, up to this X of UI in front. So this is not here in front. Okay, and what you then do, you, you look at the behavior of this linear and quadratic loop equation and you somehow combine these two equations and get that each omega zero n plus one around the ramification point beta i behaves like y of z minus y of sigma of z equal to this prime sum 
is usually here defined plus something regular, which is very ugly, but we don't care about it. This is the important point. And also here around the antidiagonals, we have the same form. So we have x of ui plus y of z. And you have to integrate this function here. I said that we can integrate them. They're integrable. And uh, I mean, this comes from the fact that uh, we have here all the time uh, these derivatives. And uh, here also, don't, don't care about that too much. But we have also around all these anti-diagonals, very similar structure. Also here, this prime sum over these two sets equal to something which is regular. And then the idea is only that you take this omega zero n plus one, you write it with this Cauchy integral. You can add a lot of these terms which are actually vanishing. I mean, you need them because Q goes to Z and we know this is integrable. So this part actually vanishes. And then you take the residue of, of all the rest. You take the residue of around the beta i's and the minus uj's of all the, of the anti-diagonal and all the branch points. And then you include, or then you insert the previous uh, equations. So which we had here, the behavior around the ramification point and the behavior around the anti-diagonal here downstairs. And then, oh, sorry. <clears throat> and then, um, yeah, yeah, you insert it here and have, I mean, you have to divide by this one part here. So maybe again back. So we divide this equation by this, by this uh, factor on the left-hand side. So we have this part divided by y of z minus y of sigma of z. And also here divide this expression uh, by this term. And the important point is that this thing here on the numerator vanishes to order one, which makes this regular part, which was very complicated, also vanishing. So we don't care anymore about this regular part and only this part somehow survives. And this gives us somehow the reason why we built this recursive kernel only by this Bergman part of omega zero two, but not from the rest. And this at the end finishes the proof and uh, it's quite technical, but it's a clear extension of proofs in other papers of topological recursion. Okay, first, uh, are there, I'm sorry, are there any questions? If there's any question, please ask. So if not, then I will say something about genus one as well. So solving this, this uh, loop equations, again, this <clears throat> dyson schwinger equation gives also something at genus one, which is also rather hard to, to, to solve. So also here, the, the, the blue part this gives us the poles at the ramification points. These are exactly of the same form as in topological recursion. But if you include our omega zero two uh, with this additional term, you get also this, but which gives you a, a pole at the um, ramification point. And you find some additional structure again, that we have here also a pole at zero, if z is equal to zero. And this cannot be produced again by topological recursion because zero is not the ramification point. And this is then also here our kind of blob. And uh, this one has to be computed, but why is this point z equals zero so important? Why does it appear? I mean, z equals zero is the point where uh, this global involution of the spectral curve has its fixed point. If you send z to minus z, there's z equal to the, uh, the, the fixed point. And uh, this is some other explanation where also this kind of term appear. Uh, okay. So this was essentially everything what I wanted to say about this omegas. And actually there's also another relation to non-crossing partitions I included yesterday evening into my slides only to, to make maybe also a connection to maybe not direct free probability, but to non-crossing partitions. I said that um, all these correlation functions are exactly of the same, or this loop equation are exactly of the same form as in the Hermitian two matrix model. And Ena told us in his lectures that you can somehow decompose if you have, mm, 
So if you have one genus zero, one boundary of mixed colors, let's say of uh, n times mixing colors, you can express it in terms of only this H zero ones, where you have one boundary with only two colors on it. And exactly the recursive equation, he, he didn't give the recursive equation, but it's of this form, also the Hermitian two matrix model. But um, the point is you can use this equation, insert it back here and insert it again back here. And then you get this expression or this, this, this theorem he gave, where it's written of this sum over all this cycles, sigma, and he has this C sigma times all this uh, H zero ones. <clears throat> and actually, they appear also here in this expression. So if you insert this equation back and back and back, you see that you have a lot of terms. And first of all, it has not the structure and now has shown. But if you use a lot of this kind of relations, you can bring it exactly in the same form as Anna has proven. And I'm, uh, I mean, we have also a paper on that one. And, um, and what at the end is the result is that you have somehow a Catalan problem, right? Non crossing. Um, this non crossing problem is related to the Catalan problem, and where you have a Catalan problem, and inside each of these Catalan problems, there's a second Catalan problem. It's at the end of the form of some kind of nested Catalan problems. It was uh, maybe interestingly to know. Um, but the point is, we have here this explicit recursive equation. And this is also known exactly in the Hermitian two matrix models, but we can go further. We have for any of this G, Gs, so we have uh, at the end B of this uh, mixed boundaries, but for any of this G, Gs, we have this recursive equation. And actually, this is not known in the Hermitian two matrix model. I guess there should be the same, should have exactly the same shape. Uh, for any number of mixed boundaries, if you give it then at the end uh, by something you actually know on the right hand side coming, uh, I mean, from the from Euler characteristic, have uh, less of that, more Euler characteristic. And then there's uh, there a question. I mean, Anna said that this in the Hermitian two matrix model is related to non crossing partitions, and we have that for any genus. And for any number of boundaries, it's of this form, have that also some interpretation of non-crossing partitions, maybe of genus zero, maybe with B boundaries, um, after you include this non-trivial cancellations. And is this equation, if it's available, similar in the Hermitian two matrix model? But the important point is, if you have this formula, then this formula proves the cyclic symmetry within one boundary. Uh, I mean, one of the last uh, comments by Anna was they want to prove in this Hermitian two matrix model that this mixed boundaries are cyclic symmetric. But as soon as you have this formula, this proves by induction the cyclic symmetry in each of the boundaries. It's uh, not obvious. I mean, uh, you have to prove it by induction and have to know it. I mean, then for one Euler characteristic minus one Euler characteristic less and so on and for then bigger boundaries and so on but this is actually then possible as soon as you has uh, this formula okay then uh, I will talk about a little bit about my open problem so we are interested in the recursive structure for all of this of our omega gns if we have some I don't know very uh, natural way to describe the blobs in this uh, problem, then is there some en enumerative interpretation about our model? So in terms of intersection numbers, and uh, is there another, I would say a way to define unique, a kind of unique blobs, or is there a certain different classes of blobs which have also some very natural structure? And actually, if we want to recover again, this non-commutative quantum field theory on the Moyal space, we had to do some limits. So we had all the time this explicit sums, this discrete sums, and they tend them to integrals. And uh, in that case, so if we go back to this Moyal plane and some kind of continuum limit, we end up in combinatorics, from combinatorics perspective, in iterated integrals. And 
explicitly on the 2D Moyal plane, we have this form of R of Z, but the, the symmetry still holds. So this is seems very similar to problems connected to simple Hurwitz numbers. And uh, yeah, we want to make this clearer, this relation to other areas in uh, maybe Hurwitz number, intersection numbers, but this is not yet, uh, it's under investigation, let's say. Okay, there were my open questions, maybe now your open questions. <laughs> <clears throat> so we definitely have some time for open questions oh, or close questions that's also fine so when you show this formula where you have extra poles at z equals zero yeah uh, in your omegas and so you say you interpret that as a blob part I would uh, interpret them as blob part, yeah. And um, so, in fact, it is possible when omega zero two is not as doesn't only have poles on the diagonal, it is possible that the usual topological recursion has poles elsewhere at uh, as the ramification points. Therefore, I'm wondering if it could not be even simpler than blobs. Just you would just have another omega zero two. Yes, but the problem is in this derivation, in the proof I showed, you assume that um, you have a global spectral curve somehow. It's somehow globally de defined. And as soon as it's, I guess, globally defined, this is not possible, right? Um, no, but your omega, if you take an omega zero two, for example, that has these uh, poles at uh, Z1 plus Z2, yeah. um, then you can create something else. Or if your omega zero two has poles of course, it's not the usual Bergman kernel, but the definition of TR still makes sense. Yeah, but I mean, the difference was, which I actually wanted to highlight, that here in the, um, in the definition of the kernels, I only used the Bergman part and not the full omega zero two. So here in the defin definition of the kernels, I mean, this comes out from computation. This is not something I have the freedom for. This is, comes out and I use it uh, that only the, yeah, this Bergman part of omega zero two is used in the uh, recursive kernel. So, for example, imagine that you add some um, term which has pole at z one or z two equals zero. Yeah. Um, it may be, but for certain things, it doesn't contribute. But in some terms, it may create some poles at z equals zero. Yeah, it may create some poles at z equals zero, right? But if I would include also this part, this would create poles at minus beta i, so on the negative ramification points. And if we look at the first example we have computed, you don't have we them. don't have them. Mm -hmm. So this is somehow the wrong picture. I mean, we can, I can, I can include them, and I can then maybe subtract uh, blobs where also have poles at that point, and they are can cancel at the end. This is possible, but I mean, this is somehow the natural uh, or the canonical way to write this. It comes out from the from the loop equation. I mean, I I, I haven't chosen anything. Yes, thank you. You mentioned combinatorics of iterated integrals. Yeah. Maybe you said something I missed. It. Could you uh, explain a little bit uh, what yeah. you have in mind? So I haven't talked about the combinatorial picture behind it. If you know the Konsevich model, you know maybe that uh, if you want to compute the maps uh, of this matrix model, then uh, it's maybe better to look at the ribbon graphs. And uh, then I would draw it let's say one type of ribbon graph it's of this form and you have here a let's say this is phase b and this n and our Feynman rules then say that this graph is given by ea plus eb this coming from this weak contraction and we heard all about that here um, times the sum over n equal to one up to d one over ea plus en coming from this edge, this edge, and this edge are here. So if we do now this uh, continuum limit, what happens is that this sum converges somehow to uh, an integral. So let's say we are on the 2D Moyal space. 
And then what we would have is actually something like, let's choose them quite easy, A plus X. And if you want to do a renormalizable quantum field theory, you actually have to integrate from zero to infinity, which is not defined. And then you have to do some uh, renormalization things and so on. But this is somehow the first, from physics, the first loop or the, the, the first loop uh, picture. And then you have, of course, more complicated things like, I don't know, this kind of graphs, or you have, I don't know, this kind of graphs. And then you have iterated integrals from combinatorial perspective. And so what people already know about how to deal with them in regular quantum field theory, can you use this back in this, in your theory? What, uh, uh, excuse me again. What people already know in the in regular quantum field theory, how to compute such uh, amplitudes, can you? I mean, yeah, yeah, in regular quantum field theory, the Feynman rules are more complicated. You have uh, fermions, you have bosons and so on. In our case, um, it's much easier, the Feynman rules. And at the end, it's only iterated integrals. And you can compute it with some computer algebras up to maybe order 10. And uh, you only stay in this iterated integrals and not have any higher elliptic iterated integrals or higher. So uh, you, you don't see any interesting numbers or so. Uh, I mean, at the end, the correlation function, these omegas, are, if you want to interpret it, generating functions of iterated integrals. So this is quite interesting. And there we have maybe also a link to number theory because you compute with topological recursion, generating function of iterated integrals. Thank you. Any more questions? So I, um, I have a question. I hope you can hear me. I'm uh, Yeah, remote, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah. But also outside. So, um, but uh, so this is Walter. Um, and since you were mentioning this, co this connection between the conservation or the generalized conservation to this, uh, the structure we found with the brackets in the spectral action, could you maybe indicate where to find this, such expressions? And, uh, or is it actually in the other conservation model that you were not talking about? Um, uh, which expression exactly do you mean? Um, I mean, in the Konsevich model, the definition of the partition function is very similar, right? You have here, uh, instead of phi to the four, you have phi to the three. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this yeah, is but, the only difference. But I think you mentioned uh, uh, that there was a very similar structure that I, uh, uh, I talked about uh, uh, with the brackets. Uh, ah, yes, 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 I remember, but, um, so uh, the similar structure was in the talk of Severin before, it was uh, in the generalized conservative model, and it's somehow, um, or, or if you want to see the analog in our model, um, I have to go this slide, so the analog in our model is this equation, so in the yeah, in exactly. Case, yeah, it was okay. linear. in your case, it was linear, but in our case, it's non-linear. Here, this uh, somehow recursive equation, and uh, this makes it completely different. So we have, but okay, uh, in your language, this equation is uh, computed by the what identity. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's very good. Thanks for this, yeah, pointing. Uh, thanks. Thank you. I, um, uh, for in the next slide, uh, in slide 25, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so this formula, how did you get it exactly? Yeah, I mean, this is what I mentioned. This is we physicists say that it's called the Watt identity. If you do some UN transformation of your partition function, you see that the action is not invariant under this UN transformation. We get you some non-trivial equation, and then you can use it and uh, do some calculation. I mean. I can maybe also talk about a little bit about the picture here. So we have B boundaries. And what the first thing is here, you split the first boundary in two. So this slab, this vertical line here, but you decrease one genus. The next one is that you somehow merge two boundaries. And the last one is that you completely distinguish uh, the correlation function. It uh, has a very natural picture, but um, the nonlinear part is only somehow here at the, at the bottom. And all the rest is first of all linear, but then recursively it gets nonlinear. Okay, so you get it by matrix 
uh, model. You, okay. You okay. get it by somehow deforming the matrix model in a certain way. Okay, but so you don't get it from a spectral curve? Uh, no, no, no. Okay. No, so no, we I, get I it guess by. The statement of uh, Bertrand was trying to prove it from the spectral curve. Okay, this is maybe also I, possible. Maybe yeah. this is possible. Um, but in our case, it was some, some, some identity we had. We called it the, the word identity. And from that one, we get that maybe there's also a very fancy deformation of the matrix model in the Hamishan matrix model where you can get similar things. Okay. But I don't know. Thanks. Any more questions? Oh, I still have a small question, like relating to the previous uh, talk. Yeah. Your, well, you have some kind of symmetry, and it, it looks very close to this uh, simplex invariance, like switching x and y. But you have some signs. Yeah. Um, well, most of these signs would probably just give some some extra signs for the correlators as well. Have you looked at it from that perspective at all? Like, would you would you know what kind of? I mean, in the uh, first proof I mentioned, which is uh, very hard to do, we need actually here a very interesting identity between flipping a sign. And this is uh, an important thing. And I mean, in the in the sense of maybe uh, topological recursion, you're also interested in this XY symmetry. Maybe you change one of the boundaries to X and one of the boundaries to Y, and this is maybe similar to that. But um, the symmetry of the spectral curve, I, I mean, we computed it, I, it's an interesting thing. But I could not say anything more about it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, if there are no more questions, let's thank Alexander again. <laughs>